the last of our uh, cancer talks. It's going to be by Chris Vakish. Chris is a um, molecular oncologist, and he's been at Cold Spring Harbor his whole career. He was the first to identify uh, Bromo domain um, type 4 as a dependency in MYC expression in cancer. He uh, identified it using genetic tools that Scott Lowe and Greg Hannon helped, ident helped make at Cold Spring Harbor and then uh, started a collaboration with James Bradner, um, who was then at Dana-Farber. Since that initial observation, he's moved on to identify many other uh, proteins in the epigenome, which are important in patterning cancer cells. He's identified them as dependencies, and he's created his own suite of genetic tools to uh, dissect their function. Um, his efforts have ranged um, the broad spectrum of cancer biology from liquid tumors, such as in the beginning, to now more solid tumors, uh, small cell lung cancer, pancreas cancer, et cetera. Um, and his interest uh, currently is about the plasticity of cancer and how that can be explained at the level of the epigenome. His office is right next to mine, and so I, I hear about the amazing discoveries uh, very often, and it's very stimulating to have him as a, a colleague at Cold Spring Harbor. So, uh, Chris is going to tell us about some of his work today. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you, Dave, and the other organizers for the invitation to be here. Um, it's really a pleasure to participate in this meeting today. Um, as Dave already mentioned, I'm an epigenetics guy, and my lab studies essentially how these types of uh, proteins depicted here, chromatin regulators, transcription factors, uh, no pointer. Okay. Oh, there's another one. Okay. How these types of proteins participate in the pathogenesis of cancer. Our interest for several years now has really been on blood cancers and using genetic screens to discover how leukemias become addicted to various types of chromatin proteins. Um, but a few years ago, um, I was convinced by a colleague of mine whose office is next door to me that epigenetics might be interesting in solid tumors as well. Um, and so we've started extending our work into various solid tumors, and that's what I will talk about today. This is actually the first time I've ever given a talk where I'm not going to talk about leukemia. So uh, uh, bear with me. This is, this is new stuff for me. Uh, and so the, the theme of, the, of what I'll talk about, I think, fits with this meeting with regard to heterogeneity, and in particular, intertumoral heterogeneity, how different patients with the same diagnosis can have quite different epigenetic states. Um, and so I'll, I'll sort of discuss this theme of lineage. Um, and so the tumors I'll be discussing, I'll, I'll tell you two short stories. Uh, one is on pancreatic cancer and work we did with Dave, we've been doing and are continuing to do with Dave Tuvison's lab. Uh, and then I'll tell you a short story about recent work in small cell lung cancer. Um, and again, this theme of ep epigenetic subtypes of these two different types of cancer. OK, so I'll just summarize a study we published. Uh, this is work we did with Dave. Um, uh, it's published. I'll give you just kind of a, a summary of the highlights of this study. But the question that we asked was, how does chromatin and en en enhancer landscapes change during the progression of pancreatic cancer? And we took advantage of a culture system that Dave developed together with Hans Klevers uh, using uh, organoid cultures derived from various stages of uh, a pancreatic cancer mouse model, the KPC model. Um, um, and so a variety of culture, organic cultures were derived from each of these stages of this model. Dave has shown that these cultures uh, 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 recapitulate the various stages of disease from which they are derived. And the question we asked very simply, which is, how does chromatin change when one compares these different cultures to one another? If one just takes an unbiased assessment of these changes, what does one find? And the major finding, uh, the most remarkable finding was, d is depicted here. This is a series of, of organoid cultures. And what you'll see is a, a site of histone acetylation that's acquired in every one of the organoid-derived cultures that came from a metastatic sample. Bear in mind, every one of these cultures came from a different mouse, from a metastatic lesion at a different anatomical site. Nevertheless, every one of these samples Come, shows an, a gain of an enhancer at the exact same location. And in fact, this was the, the, the most dominant category of chromatin changes we identified. There are, in fact, close to 1,000 regions of the genome that gain histone acetylation in these metastasis-derived organoids. This is sort of a meta-composite 
depiction of this gain of acetylation. And the mechanism that underlies this is a transcription factor called FOXA1, which is upregulated in pancreatic cancer. Every one of these sites of gained acetylation coincides with a binding site of this transcription factor. FOXA1 is indeed upregulated um, during the, the natural progression of these tumors. In fact, the expression is, uh, becomes apparent in the primary tumors uh, and further enriched in metastatic lesions. One sees this in the mouse. One sees this in human samples as well. This is a microarray study of normal tumor and metastatic lesions showing progressive FOXA1 upregulation. One can see this in human patient-derived human organoids as well. And just to show you that this is not a mouse-specific phenomenon, this is also not an organoid-specific phenomenon. One can take human pancreatic cancer cell lines, and these are ranked based on color by the level of FOXA1 expression that they have. And now looking at the orth orthologous region from the mouse genome and the human genome, one sees that cell, pancreatic cancer cell lines with low FOXA1 have low acetylation, but this acetylation is apparent in, in scales with the degree of FOXA1 expression, showing that it's not an organoid or murine-specific phenomenon. What was interesting about this is FOXA1 is normally expressed at quite low levels in pancreatic cancer as well as in the normal pancreas, but it becomes expressed at very high levels during the foregut endoderm development um, and then becomes progressively shut off um, in the fully developed pancreas. Um, and so FOXA1 is a classic pioneer factor of foregut endoderm specification. And so we wondered if, is that developmental program that FOXA1 is regulating normally relevant to this chromatin change we see in, in these metastatic organoids? Indeed, it is the case. So you can look at these gain regions defined in these metastatic samples, and you can look at chromatin data obtained from human embryonic stem cells, or those differentiated to posterior foregut, and one sees that these same regions that we identified in cancer cells are, in fact, activated during normal developmental processes. And so the advantage of this is by determining that FOXA1 was important for this chromatin change, we can now perform experiments where we manip manipulate FOXA1 to sort of implement this chromatin change artificially into cancer cells that don't already have FOXA1 expression. And so we some, we off, in several of these models, we had to combine FOXA1 with other transcription factors. But without really altering the genotype of, the, of the, these cultures, we can introduce ectopically this chromatin state that we uh, identified in this organoid progression model. And in doing so, we can characterize what the phenotypic consequences are of implementing this enhancer program. And, and we see a variety of aggressive phenotypes, one of which is uh, an enhanced metastatic potential of these cells um, when injected via telvein and colonizing uh, the lung parenchyma. And so the the summary of the study and the model is as follows, that there's a set of enhancers that are activated during normal foregut endoderm development. These enhancers revert into a poised state enforced by the loss of FOXA1 expression in the normal pancreatic ducts. During the progression of pancreatic cancer, FOXA1 expression is elevated, and this leads to a reactivation of these otherwise poised enhancers, and we believe this activation confers aggressive phenotypes, which includes more invasive primary tumors, and an enhanced metastatic potential. Another way of depicting this is that we think this FOXA1 high chromatin state emerges in the primary tumor in pancreatic cancer. We see this in mouse as well as in human. And this state is under positive selection, both in the primary tumor and with regard to an enhanced metastatic potential. But there was a challenge, and actually one of the reviewers of our study gave us a really hard time about this point, and I, I, I want to bring it up here because it actually motivated us to, to, to do the entire study I'm about to tell you, which is if one separates FOXA1 high from FOXA1 low pancreatic cancer, you'll see that the outcome of these patients is not all that different. Um, and so how can a, a factor that's promoting the aggressiveness of this disease not be correlated with a poor outcome in these patients? However, this is pancreatic cancer. I mean, all of these patients have a poor outcome across the board. It's just the FOXA1 high is not an exceptionally poor outcome. And so this prompted us to think about what will, one way to explain this would be that FOXA1 is not the only mechanism of, of enhanced metastasis in this disease. There maybe there are other mechanisms operating in different subsets of patients that are perhaps mutually exclusive from this one. And so we were motivated by a study um, from Bailey et al. that performed transcriptome profiling of a large panel of human pancreatic tumors. And in this study, they sort of came up with multiple subtypes of this disease just based on gene expression. 
and, and the two subtypes that I think have been most validated in, in which I'll be discussing um, next is a pancreatic progenitor subtype as well as a squamous subtype. And this is just based on sort of an unsupervised clustering. And what was shown is that while this is universally a poor prognosis disease, it's the squamous subtype that has the most exceptionally poor outcome in pancreatic cancer. And what we realized is that this FOXA1 high state is really quite limited to this progenitor subtype, and perhaps explaining why it's not linked to an exceptionally poor outcome. But this, of course, led us to wonder, well, what is going on in the squamous subtype of pancreatic cancer? If it's not a fo this FOXA1 program that we identified in this mouse organoid model, is there another program of enhancer changes that's occurring in this other subtype of disease? And, and I'll, I'll show you. Uh, summary of the study. And, and then the question we're asking as well along the way is, is this squamous identity uh, really a causal mechanism in the pathogenesis of pancreas cancer? Because this study just supports that it might be a correlation. Um, and so I think our study addresses this as well. So the way that we approach this is the following, which is if we, we have all this transcriptome data, data, progenitor versus squamous subtype pancreas cancer, if we just mine that data and ask, what is the most highly expressed transcription factor in squamous subtype pancreas cancer. The outlier in this analysis is a transcription factor called P63, TP63, a homolog of TP53, which you just heard about from Carol. And again, showing, that, showing also as well is that how FOXA1 is linked to this progenitor subtype. Unlike FOXA1, separating patients based on P63 expression does correlate with poor outcome. Um, and P63 really made a lot of sense as a potential master regulator of this process because it's been well established that P63, really unlike P53, is really a lineage driving transcription factor. Um, it's a P63 knockout has defects in a variety of squamous epithelial lineages, making sense why it would be linked to squamous subtype pancreas cancer. What's interesting about it is the squam in fact, there are no squamous cells in the normal pancreas. Um, there is no P63 expression in normal pancreatic tissue. And so it's another interesting element of this is that it's, it's really aberrantly expressed in these tumors. And just for Carol and maybe a few others that know something about these genes, it's, I'll be talking exclusively about the delta N isoform. Um, and so the question is, is P63 causal in, in endowing these pancreatic tumor cells with this squamous cell identity? And so we use the transcriptome data derived from this tum these tumor cohorts, uh, extracted a squamous identity transcriptional signature, as well as a progenitor identity. We took a, a panel of human pancreatic cancer cell lines, and based on these signatures, ranked them from those that look most, more progenitor or more squamous-like. And sure enough, P63 expression correlates very nicely with the most squamous subtype cell lines. And then we can take the most squamous cell line, knock out P63 in this context, and perform RNA-seq, and we see a suppression of this patient-derived squamous identity signature, and then an upregulation of this progenitor signature, as well as the loss of various squamous lineage markers. We can do the converse experiment. Take a cell line that lacks P63, that has more of a progenitor identity, and then force P63 expression, again, the delta N isoform. This is sufficient to activate these squamous lineage markers, activate this patient-derived squamous signature, and silence the progenitor signature showing that P63 is indeed necessary and sufficient for the state. Upon establishing these results, we can now do chromatin profiling of P63 positive versus negative pancreatic cancer to ask the question we're interested in, which is, is there an enhancer landscape that is linked to P63 expression? And quite strikingly, these P63 positive pancreatic cancer samples, one of which is an organoid, one is a cell line, have close to 1,000 different enhancers that are active in this subset of lines that are completely inactive in the rest of the more progenitor-like lines. A gene ontology of these elements shows that they're highly enriched with, they're linked to genes that are uh, associated with classical squamous lineage tissues. They're also linked to squamous cell carcinoma. So we think that this set of enhancers is that of the normal squamous lineage that's being activated apparently by P63 in this context. And, and so another way that we can show the link between P63 and the enhancers is to simply take, knock out P63 in a pancreatic cancer cell line that has native P63 expression. We see a, a deactivation of these squamous lineage enhancers 
An example is shown here at these classic squamous lineage cytokeratins. Conversely, we can introduce P63 ectopically in a progenitor cell line. And this is itself sufficient entirely by itself to, to instate the squamous lineage uh, enhancer configuration. And what's remarkable about P63 is you can basically introduce it into any pancreatic cancer cell line. And by itself, it's sufficient to activate thousands of these squamous lineage enhancers. This is a meta profile four different pancreatic cancer cell lines. And so it really doesn't need anything else to help it. It's really sufficient to introduce this chromatin profile. And so along the same lines as the logic of our, the FOXA1 story, this ability to sort of endow a, a pancreatic cancer cell line with squamous attributes allows us to now ask, well, what is the phenotypic consequence of this introducing the squamous lineage chromatin state? And so if you plate these cells in 3D matrigel conditions, the SU2 cell line forms these very ordered uh, 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 spherical, almost organoid-like uh, cell morphologies. By introducing P63, we see a much more invasive and larger uh, morphology in 3D. Um, in, uh, we also see an enhanced uh, motility and a classic scratch uh, wound healing assay. However, what's interesting is these P63 expressing cell lines actually grow in 2D less efficiently than uh, parental cells. So they seem, at least in 2D conditions, rather unfit. And so this motivated us to inject these cells uh, orthotopically into the pancreas to see what the outcome would be in a more native in vivo environment. And consistent with the 2D culture results, when you inject P63 reprogrammed cells into the pancreas, at initial time points, these cells are kind of struggling and growing less efficiently than uh, their control counterparts. But as time elapses, these cells really take off and eventually uh, out exceed the growth of the, of the control counterpart cells. And at the terminal time point of this experiment, result in much larger tumors. Um, and so there's this, seems to be a, a very, uh, uh, the aggressiveness of these cells is most apparent under in vivo conditions. And um, P63 indeed establishes these squamous-like uh, tumors that are um, more aggressive than their control counterparts. And so just to summarize, um, in kind of placing this in, in comparing it to what I've just showed you about FOXA1, we think in the progenitor subtype of pancreatic cancer, there is this activation of FOXA1 that sort of rejuvenates this developmental program of the normal developing foregut endoderm. But in a mutually exclusive subtype of pancreatic cancer that's been previously called this squamous subtype, it's also referred to as basal subtype, there's something that's similar but also quite different, which is for reasons that aren't completely clear, this P63 expression, which is not part of any normal developing pancreas or normal pancreatic ducts, um, P63 becomes expressed and is by itself sufficient to introduce a large program of enhancers um, through its direct occupancy at these sites. Both of these mechanisms, while they occur at completely different sites, both allow for more invasive primary tumors and enhanced metastasis. Again, depicted in another way, we think that both of these chromatin states are under positive selection, but in different subsets of patients. Um, so there, I think these observations, I think, raise more questions than they address, particularly regarding the origin of what actually is the causal, what is the signal that sort of causes these factors uh, to become aberrantly expressed. When are they expressed? What are the dynamics of these chromatin states? Is this reversible? Is this irreversible? And of course, with our interest in target discovery with genetic screens, um, trying to find vulnerabilities that are linked to these mutually exclusive states is something we can now explore with some of these culture models we've been developing. All right, so I'm just going to take the last few minutes, totally switch gears, um, tell you about a different cancer we started studying. This is what Dave started when he got us thinking about solid tumor biology. Another cancer. Um, I would say equally as aggressive and um, lethal as pancreatic cancer is small cell lung cancer, which is the most aggressive form of lung cancer of which there are no effective targeted therapies. What is interesting about this tumor is that it's widely believed to be derived from a pulmonary neuroendocrine cell. So this is not an epithelial carcinoma. These tumors are thought to come from these rare cells that exist in the normal lung that have neuroendocrine functions. And this 
view is supported by the fact that the majority of small cell lung cancer tumors express markers of this neuroendocrine lineage. However, it's also been known, work from John Minna and others, that a subset of small cell lung cancer, 15% of patients, histologically these tumors look like small cell lung cancer. But these tumors do not express markers of this lineage. And so this is a recent transcriptome uh, genome study of, of small cell lung cancer, uh, performing unsupervised clustering of RNA-seq data from these tumors. And what was shown here is that, um, consistent with what I just told you, about 15% of tumors are histologically small cell, but do not have any of the neuroendocrine markers of this, of this disease. However, genetically, both of these tumors look very similar to each other. They're caused by RBP53 mutations. Similar poor outcomes in both of these types of tumors, raising the question, what is the bio biological significance of neuroendocrine low small cell lung cancer? Um, and so this is something we completely stumbled into. Um, in our lab, we do a lot of CRISPR-based screening looking for cancer cell line dependencies. And so we decided to go about knocking out all of the transcription factors encoded in the human genome in a large panel of cancer cell lines, large panel, 30 or so cancer cell lines, which included seven small cell lung cancer cell lines. And the question, very simply, can we discover a new transcription factor that small cell lung cancer is addicted to that's dispensable in other types of cancer? When we carried out these screens, we identified several transcription factors that, when knocked out, suppress the growth of small cell lung cancer cell lines and minimal effects in other types of cancer, indeed, whereas others, knockouts affect all of these cell lines. Most of these factors, SOX4, NeuroD1, and U2F3, OTX2, had already been known to play a role in small cell. But the factor we studied, we focused on, was called POW2F3. POW2F3 has never been studied, actually never been studied in cancer, to my knowledge. Certainly never been investigated in this disease. And what we realized is, so you look at POW2F3 knockout, it affects, has a powerful effect in these CRISPR screens on a few of these cell lines, but not in the others. What we realized is that every small cell lung cancer cell line that was addicted to POW2F3 expressed POW2F3. The majority of small cell lung cancer cell lines do not express this at all, and of course, they don't need it. And so, again, this issue of heterogeneity arose, from, but again, this is cell lines. So the question is, does this have any relevance to real human small cell lung cancer? And so we used tissue microarrays to stain over 200 tumor specimens for POW2F3 expression. Kind of consistent with the cell lines, we found that about 10% of small cell tumors, again, histologically, these are all small cell, but about 10% express this transcription factor at very high levels, whereas it's silent in the rest. We can go back to this kind of TCGA-style study of small cell lung cancer that separates these two subtypes. We look at POW2F3 expression, and we find that it's indeed highly expressed in about 15% of tumors, but it's exclusively expressed in the neuroendocrine low subtype of these tumors. This is just the second independent cohort showing the same thing. And so it seems to be linked to this variant of small cell, but the question is what does this, what will, what does POW2F3 actually tell us about the biology of neuroendocrine low small cell lung cancer? And so we were guided by a few studies very recently that were published really while we were carrying out this work that showed that POW2F3 is a master regulator of a cell type known as the tough cell lineage. You gotta remember, I'm a blood leukemia guy. I had never heard of tough cells. Uh, these are cells that are really just sprinkled throughout the GI tract and also the respiratory tract. And these are rare chemosensory cells that are involved in a wide range of functions, including taste. Uh, they have a function in the GI tract that I'll mention in a second. They're also known to be found in the trachea. There are a variety of markers of this tough cell lineage. Notably, a POW2F3 knockout mouse is actually viable, and the only defect in these animals is they, they lack these tough cells. So these mice have a defect in taste. They, because they lack tough cells in the intestine, these cells have an immune function. So these, these mice are susceptible to parasite infections. Um, and so the, the idea that this raises, is there a link between the tough cell lineage and these small cell tumors that express this factor at high levels? And so we went again to this study I re keep referring to that did transcriptome of a large panel of cell, uh, small cell tumors. And if you separate these tumors based on POW2F3 high and low expression, consistent with what I just told you, if you look at neuroendocrine markers, these tumors do not spatially express zero 
zero reads for any of these neuroendocrine markers. But if you now look at tough cell markers, which again we're extracting from this recent literature, you'll see that every one of these tough lineage markers is expressed at high levels in pow 2 f 3 high tumors and essentially zero levels in neuroendocrine tumors. I'll just go through this quickly, but we've done chromatin profiling of small cell lung cancer cell lines. pow 2 f 3 positive small cell has a different chromatin configuration than pow 2 f 3 negative small cell lung cancer. Kind of like the pancreatic cancer stories I just told you, there's a, there's a collection of enhancers that are unique to pow 2 f 3 positive small cell lung cancer. These are universally bound by pow 2 f 3 Again, consistent with the idea that this is a different lineage. The differences in chromatin we see among these cell lines is as different as comparing a myeloid cell to a lymphoid cell, consistent with being different lineages. So it's known that these cells are present in the trachea and in the GI tract and in the taste buds. In fact, it's never been shown that these cells exist in the lung. And so it's known that small cell lung cancer preferentially occurs in these central airway locations. We looked for pow 2 f 3 expression. And indeed, we find in these primary airways that there are these rare cells that stain very highly uh, positively for pow 2 f 3 um, and uh, <coughs> precisely in the locations that these tumors emerge. And so I'll just conclude by saying that the main conclusion of this study is that this disease, small cell lung cancer, which you can tell just from the name, small cell lung cancer, this is a histological definition that is not very molecular in terms of what it's describing. These are small cells, and it's lung cancer. What I'm telling you is that you can separate this definition of cancer into two different molecular entities, one that resembles a neuroendocrine cell, expresses neuroendocrine markers like chromogranin, and another that expresses pow 2 f 3 and other tough lineage markers. So we would hypothesize that these two tumors may come from different cells of origin in the lung. And so this is something we're actively pursuing um, in the lab right now. Um, we hypothesize that a pulmonary neuroendocrine cell can acquire genetic mutations and give rise to this neuroendocrine-like tumor. Conversely, a pulmonary tough cell that already expresses pow 2 f 3 may serve as a cell of origin. Of course, there could also be dynamic transdifferentiation occurring as well, but we're attempting to model this uh, tough cell um, form of disease in the mouse currently. And then the second hypothesis, I think the most exciting one, getting back to interesting versus useful, um, could these two different diseases, now that we can easily discriminate them through a simple immunohistochemical stain, could they perhaps respond differently to targeted therapies? And so this is something we can uh, explore using uh, domain-focused CRISPR screening. And so, just as an, as an example of this, we've taken a CRISPR library that knocks out all 500 kinases encoded in the human genome. And we've knocked out all these kinases in a cell line that either is pow 2 f 3 high or pow 2 f 3 low. And so most kinases that are essential are essential in both of these cell lines. But there's one exception, which is IGF-1R, which has a powerful effect in a pow 2 f 3 high small cell and really no effect in a pow 2 f 3 low. If we take an IGF-1R inhibitor, we indeed find that pow 2 f 3 high cell lines are more sensitive consistently than pow 2 f 3 low, the neuroendocrine cell lines. And so the, this type of experiment is, is leading us to kind of reevaluate targeted therapies in these two different subsets of tumors. I'll say lincitinib has actually already been in a clinical study in small cell lung cancer and failed because the response rate was too low. And so with the knowledge that you can separate these two tumors, could there be exceptional responses linked to these markers is the hypothesis we're continuing to explore. And so I'll just end by saying again that uh, I've told you two stories about tumor lineage and intertumoral heterogeneity. One is uh, in pancreatic cancer through this aberrant activation of either a foregut endoderm program in the, that expresses FOXA1 at high levels or a P63 high program that has the squamous identity. And then I've told you about small cell, this neuroendocrine and tough lineage uh, subtypes of tumors, which may be coming from a different cell of origin in the lung, or conversely, these th two cell type tumor types could be interconverting. And so I'll conclude by saying that the work on FOXA1 and pancreatic cancer was co-led by a postdoc, Jay, in my lab, and Chang Il from Dave Tubison's lab. Both have their own labs now. Uh, Tim led the study on P63. Uh, Yuhan led the work on pow 2 f 3 uh, this is our lab at Cold Spring Harbor, and uh, thank you to our collaborators. Thank you. Um, I'm fascinated by your P63 result, which is really striking. How is P63 upregulated when it's normally so low? 
Is it at the protein level or the RNA level? Both. So it's at the mRNA level. Uh, the P63 more. locus is activated uh, at this delta N promoter. That so the RNA is not, I mean, the protein is not more stable? We haven't actually explored. It, it seems to scale with the mRNA level. We haven't looked to see if there is a post-transcriptional component to it. But at first glance, it seems to correlate. The protein level correlates very well with the mRNA level. Do you level. need RAS for that to be expressed at higher levels? Uh, RAS well, it's interesting. That one cell line, BXPC3, is the same one that uh, Daphna already mentioned. It's actually a piece, KRAS wild type PDAC cell line. But in patient samples, most of them are KRAS positive. But so based on that, we've uncoupled the presence of a KRAS mutation from P63. So I'm not sure, not sure if it's causal in its expression. My, my short answer to your question, we have no idea what's causing P63 upregulation. Our study really addresses the consequences of its upregulation. No idea. We're very interested to explore this. No, it's, in it's particularly interesting because some cancers actually need to downregulate Del N P63 in order for various oncogenic activities like breast cancer. RAS actually represses P63 expression, and the cells become less invasive and so on. So it depends on the cell type. It's, a f it's really fascinating well, That's how right. different this, and the same protein can be in different in That's cells. right, and it's interesting that there are very few pancreatic cancer cell lines that keep P63 expression. So in culture, it seems like it's an unhappy, it's an unfit state. It's interesting to think that the wild type P53 might actually be more compatible with P63, might allow that cell line to keep its P63 expression. And I just say that because when we force P63 expression on cell lines, generally there's a loss of fitness. They don't like it. But if you put them into a mouse, they, they, they initially struggle, but then they grow out like weeds. So it's, you know, it's not a, it, it seems consistent with what you're saying, that it's, it's not a clear just win, win, win situation for the cell. It, there's clearly a, a context to the in vivo environment that selects for that state. So in the gut and in the pancreas, the abundance of the tough cells is oftentimes regulated by inflammatory insult and then regenerative response. Do you know if in small cell there is a component of uh, inflammatory environment that sets the process in motion? Yeah, we have no idea um, is the short answer. The, uh, this IGF-1R connection that I mentioned at the end, we think is a byproduct of the tough lineage. It's a, it's a fundamental difference, we think, between tough cells, normal tough cells, and normal neuroendocrine cells. So it, it seems, from work I'm not showing, but that the normal tough cell lineage has its own growth factor requirements and does respond to growth signals very differently than a neuroendocrine cell. And so these tumors, I think, retain those growth factor receptor requirements of the normal lineage. And indeed, it's been shown that tough cells can expand uh, in response to uh, infection in the gut. I don't know. It's, it's obviously this is in t this small cell lung cancer is entirely a byproduct of smoking. It's a disease that not, did not exist before the human invention of cigarettes. Um, so that, you know, is the dominant pathogenic mechanism. Whether inflammatory states, I don't know. Yeah, so I have a question for you. Do you see um, s the squamous and the progenitor cell in the same patient sample? And then um, did you explore the plasticity in between those two sub subtype that you know, they can they convert during therapy or? Yeah, great question. We, we haven't, to my knowledge, no one has published single cell RNA-seq, might be wrong, in a large cohort of human pancreatic cancer tumors. This is stuff people are doing, um, but we don't have an answer to that question at present. But we're, we and many others, I think, are exploring these states, because a lot of what I'm showing is just bulk assessment. So the dynamics and whether these things coexist and who comes first, I, I think all of these ideas are on the table. You I had mentioned uh, <laughs> I had a very similar question, Chris, to the last one. I hope that you will not drop completely the blood malignancy, very interesting focus. But can you extract from your gene data set it, 
to get closer to this notion of cell of origin that you keep saying is a very interesting next step of this analysis. So do you have some sense where this initial mutation came from? Speaking of small cell or just everything, broadly speaking? Oh, in, in both situations. Well, I, I would say, you know, these two stories, small cell and pancreas cancer, they, they, they seem to have a lot in common, two different tumor subtypes, two different lineage programs. In pancreas cancer, these cells are so malleable. You can put in FOXA1, and you can bring in the whole foregut endoderm program, and what, you know, FOXA1 plus a few of its friends. P63 by itself can bring the whole squamous program. If we try to do those same experiments in small cell with POW2F3 versus ASCL1, you cannot just efficiently interconvert those lineages. POW2F3, it, it clearly is needed for that tough lineage program, but it's not a very good reprogramming factor. So th that's why I, I, I think of small cell as kind of a harder landscape for inner conversion, whereas PDEC, the cells seem to be very open-minded about which lineage they're going to travel in. And so I, I don't, your question was open-ended. I'm giving an open-ended answer, but I, I think, my, my yeah. Well, it, uh, a lot of the experiments we're doing, we're nominating a, a fact, we're hunting for a transcription factor such that we can show that the lineage matters. The, the naturally occurring scenario where these things get turned on apparently is not a, addressed here. And I, and I think that's where the transcription factors are clearly critical to create that whole program. But what turns them on in the first place, they don't turn themselves on very likely. It's going to be a more complicated interaction with the microenvironment, with stress pathways, inflammatory cells. You know, I don't have a real answer to your question, but I, I don't, again, I think we can't address the origin question, just more of the consequence. So can you comment on what is it about the FOXA1 foregut endoderm enhancers that is beneficial in the metastatic case? So what, is it burst in proliferation that is required? So how, how does, how do you, hijack that program in cancer. Yeah, so we have not parsed out yet which individual genes are the most critical, which is, I think, the only way to answer your question. The, the phenotypes, I didn't get into here, but there's an enhanced invasiveness in like classic matrix gel invasion assays. Um, the cells also have no growth advantage in 2D by introducing FOXA1. So it's, but in, uh, in uh, tumor sphere formation assays, the cells have an enhanced acreage independent growth. Um, and again, in vivo, these cells are just more fit, both in the primary tumor site and in a metastatic colonization format. So that's, that's, that's the extent to which we understand it. The individual genes within that program that enable it, it's, it's hard to say, but you know, we'd speculate that it's the, you know, the, the same phenomenon is occurring in normal development, you know, this migratory effect. You know, it's tempting to invoke that the normal sort of dynamics of foregut endoderm cell phase specification could be sort of a benefit to a tumor that's basically invading other endoderm-derived <laughs> tissues um, as is most common sites of metastasis. A small cell, and uh, how do you diagnose it? Small cell is 15 to 20 percent of all lung cancer. The rest is non-small cell lung cancer. Um, it is I'm talking about symptoms in a patient. So these are all, a lot of which are nonspecific symptoms. It's primarily diagnosed in a community hospital through a histological assessment. It's often, you don't need to use markers. And I think that's why this disease definition of small cell lung cancer has persisted into 2018, because it's largely just diagnosed by morphology. Hey, I want to thank um, Carol and Chris for great talks. <laughs>